Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, our dear viewers. Uh, we are back with another episode of Dawa Made Easy. And the topic that we will be covering today, inshallah, is Islam and the, and the West. And in other words, why is West interested in Islam? Now, to cover that topic, inshallah, to shed some light on that, we have today brother Wasim with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brother. Inshallah, you're doing well. Alhamdulillah, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brother. Yes, brother, nice to see you again. Um, I would want to start it from an angle of, um, you know, in the contemporary society today um, in West, I mean, not just Australia, um, uh, you know, or in, in, in general, um, terms West as in Western society. I just wanted to understand what are some of the challenges that this society is currently facing and how does Islam really answers or, or how does Islam provide solutions to those challenges? Right. No, subhanAllah brother, this is a very um, insightful subject where we are talking about an entire society an entire civilization, which we refer as the Western civilization. And all those countries, which is not one or two, um, so we're talking about uh, more than a dozen countries, including the entirety of the Europe, um, including United States of America, United Kingdom, and all the way up here to the downtown Australia itself. So while we are talking about such vastness of a society, um, the subject requires that much of an uh, insight into it. However, for the course of our discussion, we can reduce this to certain aspects so that we can understand or analyze in light of those aspects the entirety of the challenge that we are talking about. First of all, some of the issues that the Western society is, for, is falling into is with the presence of so-called freedom, freedom to do anything, freedom to do everything, freedom to talk about anything and freedom to change the society from one decade to another, from one century to another opens a Pandora box opens several subjects and topics into it. For example, the freedom to choose what you eat and drink, which has intoxicated the entire society, where alcoholism, for example, and drugs have become a massive problem in the society. The United States government, the Western governments, the entirety of Europe, including our country Australia, is spending millions, rather billions, in order to ed educate people to drink less. This is just one of the problems. The binge drinking, the medical problems, the health reasons and the, 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 the crime rate that is increasing because of alcoholism is enormous. As well the drugs. On one hand drugs are banned in the society but at the same time the government would spend money to create safe space for people to have drugs. Because of the inability of the government to stop people from having it or to stop drugs from reaching the people. So we are simply talking about one massive problem, which is drugs and alcoholism in the society. That's one. Let us, let us look at another major issue, which is the family structure. The family structure, once again, because of so-called freedom, the family structure is almost at a breaking point. Individualism and materialism has creeped into the society in all aspects of human life where a person wants to live and wants everything to be focused on him or his, him or her individuality. And then materialistic is what they have, their focus is, that I want everything best of this dunya. I want everything the best of this world. Just because of COVID-19, for example, the lockdowns and restrictions that happened, it brought into depression and mental illness into massive um, uh, individuals and youth in the society. Why? Because they were all living a dream life. Suddenly, because of one illness, when a society went broke by being locked into the houses, they didn't know what to do in the houses. Because they are here for materialism, they are here or they have been embedded or filled with or programmed with what you call individualism. So while this, the family structure has been broken because of all of that, divorce rate is high, domestic violence is high, Men and women are not marrying anymore. They are not able to live together in, in, in a house, especially in the lockdowns, divorce rate increased once again in the society. Why? Because the people are not used to living with each other. Why all of this? Because of all these problems of family issues. This is a second major 
issue in the society. Because of this, once again, drugs and alcohol increases in the society. So it's a cycle. The family structure is, is going down. The right. third is now mental illness, depression, anxiety, and attached to that is crime rate that is increasing exponentially in the society. Every person knows what is good and bad, yet the crime rate increases. The police and the law enforcement is powerful, is strong, has weapons, has certain rules and re regulations and rights, yet crime rate keeps on increasing in the society. Why is all of this happening? These are some problems to mention on which the governments are spending a lot of energy, focus and money yet to no avail. So when we now come back to Islamic solutions, what does Islam has to offer in this scenario? What does Islam have to offer to drugs and alcoholism, for example? What does Islam have to offer in a family structure? What does Islam have to offer in order to reduce the criminality in the society? Now, to answer these, let's look at some of the teachings of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands in the Quran in Surah Maida, Surah number 5, Ayah number 90, a very clear instruction that Almighty God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited intoxication for you. So this educational teaching, which is programmed into the minds of so-called Muslims and believers, takes away the burden from the society and from the government. While Muslims live in the West, Muslims happen to be the largest teetotaler society in the world. What it means is they are the least alcoholic, while alcoholic alcohol is fully available for them. So here in Australia, for example, I or, you, I or you, we can easily go and buy alcohol, but we choose not to. While in United States of America, every Muslim also has the opportunity to get alcohol, but they do not do so. So my point here is when the teaching of Islam, see, who is ruling us? What is the law in Australia? You can drink if you want. You can buy the alcohol if you want. I and you have got money, but we don't buy. Why do majority of the Muslims choose not to buy alcohol? Not because they have got a government forcing them not to drink. Not because there is a hard punishment. If you drink alcohol, you'll be given 30 lashes in Australia. No, that's not the case. But why are we not choosing to drink? Because of the educational teaching from childhood that if you drink, the Almighty God has prohibited it. So it is going against the purpose of your life and existence in this world. So when that is happening, Muslims do not drink alcohol. I'll give you an example. We had a large peace conference here in Australia, in the city of Melbourne. And we had almost 10,000 people about together in the middle of the city. So, but obvious, we had the police availability. We had the communication with the federal police and all the other departments. You know, one of the statements, what the police in charge told me after the event, he said, this was one of the most peaceful events which we had to deal with. And I asked him why? He said to me, because there was no alcohol in the event. 10,000 people gathering in the middle of Melbourne city, yet not a single drop of alcohol or a single bottle of alcohol is broken on the streets. What it shows is that when a society is able to be educated, then they are able to be away from alcoholism. When they're away from alcoholism, the entire problem in the society that keeps on exponentially growing because of drugs and alcoholism, this is what is eliminated, if not fully eradicated. So this is just one aspect. So education pro protects it. But when there is an Islamic society, we know in, in Islam and we know from psychology of the human beings that though there is a teaching, not all people will accustom themselves or accommodate that teaching. They will go beyond it. They will break the rules. What happens when somebody breaks the rules? So Islam has different levels of support. Level one is education and awareness. Level two is rehabilitation. Level three is punishment. So when this is the chronology that is available there, a person will be isolated from committing that wrong in the society. This is one way. So I say to the, to the police department at times, if you have too many alcoholics in the society, send them to the mosque so we can make them non-alcoholic without a penny spent by the government or any of the law enforcement agencies. Similar for drugs. Moving forward to the next aspect, family structure. In Islam, once again, the awareness and education. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that your mother has borne you, has bore you for nine months with pain. So look after them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands in the Quran that obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obey your parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, do not say a word of disrespect to your parents. So the respect for parents is taken the highest position.
After obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, next comes the parents. That's the respect. The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that beneath the feet of your mother lies the paradise. If you want to go to Jannah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa advises three times, your mother, your mother, your mother, look after your mother, spend time on your mother, spend money on your mother, look after your mother and then your father. It just shows that the entirety of a person's advice and awareness and educational programming that is happening is to create that respect in the family. That's parents. Then the same for parents. What is the command for the parents about the children? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to the parents that children are your amana. That they are gift from Almighty God given to you as a responsibility. They're not your slaves, but they are given to you as responsibility. So when there is a respect, when there is respect in a structure, the husband and the wife, they look after each other. The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa divorce is permissible, but the most disliked act in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So reducing the divorce rate by educating the society. Then as I said, the next level comes when there is a problem in the society, in a family, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands, let the elders from the two family sit down and resolve the issue. This is called family counseling before you go to a counselor, before you go to the police, before you go to the courts. There is a structure in Islam, education, then comes awareness, then comes rehabilitation and counseling, and then comes the punishment and the judgment that is there in, in the courts. This stops the problems or minimizes the problems if not eliminates it. Coming to the last aspect, the criminality. There are criminals in the society. People are ready to kill people to, to steal some amount of money. People are ready to harm and abuse each other for their ego, domestic violence, or whether you call you know um, robberies in, in, in the society, or whether you call uh, attacks on each other, or assaults on each other, racism, or, or what you call um, uh, different types of assaults that happen in the society. All of these crimes have certain problems in its basic fundamental understanding. People commit crimes for various reasons. Problem of money, Islam has a solution. The system of zakah, the rotation of money. The problem of domestic violence, Islam has a solution of respecting each other. The problem of attacking, murdering, assaulting each other, Islam has the solution of what you call the sanctity of life. If you kill a person in Islam, the re reaction is a death penalty. So when the penalty is severe, the perpetrator would think several times before committing it. If I live in a country where I know if I have a quarrel with you and I end up harming you, I will be harmed as well in return by the court. If I live in a society where I know if I kill you, I will be also killed in return. I will think 100 times before killing you. But if I live in a society where if I kill you, I may get away with a six month jail or a five year jail. So I have my chances to take. The psychology of the human says they are ready to take the risks. But when the punishment is severe, the person will not go forward to that. So this is where the Sharia law comes into the picture. So this in a nutshell, picking up certain topics in the society that the West is facing today. And I can give you certain statistics. For example, the rape rate, the sexual assaults that are increasing in the United States of America and all the way up here in Australia. What's the solution? The respect for women and the severe punishment for the perpetrators. Unless you embed these two in the society, you will not be able to overcome that. According to FBI report, every year, 80,000 plus rapes take place in America. That's just if 10% of the assaults are being reported. That shows the enormity, the severity of the problem that persists. Hope that gives an understanding to the issue. Now you've um, sort of explained it um, quite well uh, and sort of um, problems and you know how does Islam gives a solution to all those problems. Now that's that's really, um, uh, you know, really puts that into perspective. Now, just along that, is that the very reason why we see that the Western society, or as you have called it as a Western civilization, is that the sole reason why they are, um, you know, um, in, you know, coming into Islam? Or if I may, from a different angle, uh, why do we see Western society as the front runner in embracing Islam? Right. Very, very intriguing question. Once again, Baba. Um, let me go a few decades back. Some of the most popular people who became Muslim in the United States of America were Muhammad Ali, the world champion boxer, 
and Malcolm X, for example. And the, and the interesting fact about both of them are they are black Americans, right? What brought them to Islam? If you ask this question, this will help us understand why the West is coming to Islam. When there is a problem and someone provides the solution, then the people are bound to get attracted towards the solution. The problem that America has is racism. And this is not just a problem within America in today's society. This has been an ongoing problem in the Western world throughout the ages. We're talking about last century. Even if you talk about two centuries ago, when America was founded, when Australia was founded, they were all conquered from the, from the indigenous races. And a mass murder, rather you may even call it a genocide of the localites was committed against these conquering races. This problem persists and continues up until today. Myself coming from India originally, it reminds me that in Australia in, in 2004 to 2008, between that period of time, there was what you call Indian racism that was occurring here on the streets of Australia. Indian migrants were attacked, assaulted, brutally robbed by the locals here in Australia. Why was that happening? And there was an element of what you call racism in that. Again, stepping back, to the time of Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. Malcolm X, when he embraced Islam, he went for Hajj and when he returned to the United States, he gave this famous interview where the journalist asked him, what have you gained by becoming, becoming a Muslim or by traveling to the pilgrimage to Mecca? He said, by traveling for pilgrimage to Mecca, to Saudi Arabia, I have brought the solution to the problem of America. And they said, what is that? He said, the problem that America faces today is racism, and the solution comes from Islam, the universal brotherhood that Islam provides. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran in Surah Hujurah, Surah number 49, and number 30, 13, that, O oh human beings, we have made you from a single pair of male and female, and then made you into nations and tribes, so that you may understand, recognize one another. Muhammad Ali, when he became Muslim, he said one of the reasons that he could see that the white man in America is making the black man a slave, while in Islam, it's the contrary. The hadith of the Prophet No Arab is superior to a non-Arab. Neither is a non-Arab superior to an Arab. Neither is white superior to a black, nor is a black superior to a white. There is equality in Islam. And the only one who is superior to other is through their God-fearfulness, is through their taqwa, is through their righteousness, is through their humanity, is through their obedience to the Almighty God. This gives everyone equal opportunity to be religious, to be obedient in the sight of Almighty God. These were some of the things that brought many of the black Americans to Islam in America. And similarly, you see these issues popping up every now and then. So I have met several people who have become Muslim for different reasons. Someone came with a domestic violence issue. And when they were aware that in Islam, the marriage structure and the Islamic family is this, they embraced Islam. When somebody came to know that alcoholism is such a massive problem in their life and they were trying to get over it and while they came to know that there is a religion which completely prohibits alcohol. Somebody who has lived through the hell of alcoholism, whose father used to beat his mother because of alcoholism, whose brother got into an accident and died because of alcoholism, whose sister was assaulted because the perpetrator was alcoholic. When this person knows that there is a society that can live without alcohol, then this person comes and embraces Islam. When people see that there is science and scientific facts mentioned in the Quran, when people see that there is psychological impact by the Islamic teachings, when people see that Islam has solution to various problems of the society, people do come to Islam and embrace. So why is the West coming to Islam? Why is West the forerunner in embracing Islam? Because when they see the solution to their problem, then but natural, they move forward towards embracing it. So why only West and not why other societies? The possibility is the awareness of Islam, the presentation of Islam as the solution to their problems. If we Muslims fall short of presenting that, then the society might be unaware of that. For example, in China right now, there is absolute ban on Islamic teachings. There is absolute ban on Islamic propagation. When that happens, then the local people, though they might want to convert to Islam, they are not having enough information or education about Islam. So they are searching from, and moving from one spiritual religion to another spiritual uh, religion. But they are not able to embrace and find solution to their problems, which lies 
in Islam. Hope that gives some sort of understanding to that. I would like to add a small statistics there. According to one of the research centers, Pew Research Center, based in the United States of America, it says that the Muslim population is the fastest growing religion in the world. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world and in the United States of America. And it predicts that by 2060, Islam is going to be the largest religion in the world. Why? There are several reasons. One, the Muslim population has higher rate of fertility. The conversion rate to Islam is much higher. The third is the retaining capacity is much higher in Islam. You see the church today, for example, Australia 20 years ago was 70 to 80 percent Christian society. In just 20 to 30 years, in three decades, Christianity became 52 percent here in Australia. It just shows that various other religions are diminishing while Islam holds its strength. You see as every single mosque, it's overfilled especially on the Fridays. You see every particular other religious society, not necessarily as spiritual as the Islamic society. So Islam has these three different strengths that it can retain its followers and believers because it has solutions. It has higher fertility rate, which is one of the reasons. And the third is the conversion to Islam. Any and every society has people who are ready to embrace Islam just as Muhammad Ali did in the last century. Yeah, good that you have mentioned spirituality and that's where I was going to go to next. Um, now, it was good, you know, while it is good to understand from a historical perspective or the examples that you shared. Um, now, I would like to basically add a connection of spirituality here. Um, and, and when we, um, you know, sort of hear this, that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, we also tend to hear that human beings they cannot run away from whatever nature god has uh, you know sent them in this world with so this purpose of life or this uh, you know nature of human beings how does that connect with islam uh, because in one of your earlier questions you did mention purpose of life so i just wanted to sort of connect all of these together to understand uh, you know from a spiritual sense how does this uh, you know uh, you know how does islam has an edge over other religions right see allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the quran in surah hujurat sorry surah fussilat surah number 41 and number 53 a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyana lahum annahu al-haqq allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Soon we shall show them our signs in the universe and within themselves. Up until they manif it is manifest to them, up until it is absolutely clear to them that this is Al-Haq, that is this religion of Islam is Al-Haq, that this book Al-Quran, the Kalam of Allah is Al-Haq, is the truth. So until then there will be signs one after the other popping up in front of the people's mind and it will keep on satisfying their hearts. So Islam is but nature of human beings. Islam relates, resonates to the heart and the mind of human beings. And this is one of the reasons that in Islam we believe that every human being is born as a Muslim. It is only then that their parents or their teachers or the society turns them away from the path of God. So what, what, what this emphasizes is from the Islamic teachings and from our belief, we understand that all human beings have been created with innate nature, with an absolute nature of humanity, with the nature of belief in God, with the nature of Islam. So what Islamic teachings and rulings are is nothing but the manifestation of human nature. Now, how do we respond to this or how do we connect this? The other point that I want to raise here is the purpose of life. The very purpose we have all been created. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Dhariyat, Surah number 51, Anima 56, jinna wal insa illa li abudun. That we have created, we have not created the humans and the jinn except that they worship, that they be obedient to Almighty God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the nature of human beings. They want to be obedient to something. Now, how does that relate to our time and society? How does that relate to what you call the innate nature, Islam, the purpose of life, and the human society today. The spiritual personality is the ruh, is the soul within the human body. Human body, the physical body has its needs, 
and the soul has its needs. The physical body requires food to eat and survive. The soul requires spirituality to feed it. And that search, that urge, that need keeps human beings moving forward in search of that truth. And when that infuses with their innate nature, it resonates. So when I have a problem and a challenge in my life, when there is no human solution to that, religion comes into the picture. For example, I have a family member who passed away. I have a bad accident to another family member in my life. What is the explanation to these incidents? They did not do anything wrong. They did not harm anybody. They did not hurt anyone. Somebody in my family is born with a disability. What is the solution to that? Why did that happen? My parents or somebody old who did all good they could in their life, they did pay the taxes, they looked after the children, but today they are thrown into the aged care. And right now you can see here in Australia, because of the COVID-19 mismanagement, the most people who have died or succumbed to death because of COVID are the people in the aged care. Why? Because the authorities did not look after them well. And why are they even there in the first place? Because these families and their children did not look after them very well. So all of this creates a massive unexpected mess in the society. What's the solution to all of that? Going back to that, spirituality, the answers to my problems. Quran says, you have all been created to be tested in this life. So whether a person is born with disability in my family or whether a relative of mine have an accident, there is an aspect of test for them and for me. How did I respond to that? How did I help or not help my family relative? And did I fulfill my responsibility? In COVID-19, people were isolated. They were not well. They were having COVID. They were COVID positive. They could not cook food. What is the responsibility of the neighbor? The Prophet ﷺ said, if your neighbor is sleeping hungry with you filling your stomach, then you are not one of us. This is where the time is to implement that. When I see this, the spirituality of Islam, the brotherhood of Islam, the humanity in Islam, the people's soul, which is searching for truth, whether it is moving from Buddhism to Judaism, from Judaism to Hinduism, from Sikhism to Christianity, wherever they keep moving, the spirituality of Islam is what resonates with the human soul. And that is why you see people coming to Islam more than people from Islam moving out. You will always have a few, a bunch moving here and there. There's always this uh, uh, migration that is happening in and out. However, the number, if you look at it, there's always a large number moving in than compared to a very small number moving out. Um, and, and just as you were explaining this, one thing that um, you know actually popped up in my mind is, you know, people may just, um, you know, take this as mere words and not really, um, you know, understand what it means. Um, so maybe, um, you know, I would like to give my viewers a challenge today. So um, go ahead, uh, you know, when you watch this and if something of this has really, um, you know, intrigued um, in you, go ahead and really experience this yourself. Lower yourself to the ground and prostrate to the Almighty and then you'll find the answer in your heart. And I hope, uh, you know, people will accept my challenge and that's when they will actually understand what, uh, you know, when you say that inner feeling of spirituality resonates when you actually accept that command of God is, uh, you know, how, um, you know, things, uh, you know, uh, will be experienced. Then. Just to add there, while, while you just mentioned that, uh, you know, one of the aspects that people can connect to um, with the spirituality of Islam without being a Muslim yet is when they need to call someone for help. So when you are in your deep problem, for example, we heard of the story of Cat Stevens, who said that he became Muslim. Why? Because when he was stuck in the middle of the river or the ocean or, or, or the, on the corner of the ocean, he was swimming and he got stuck and he could not feel that he has any strength or ability to come out. And he made a prayer in his heart that, oh God, if you are there, help me today. So I will go out and serve you. And he says that immediately when he made that prayer within his heart, he probably did not even spell it from his tongue. And he was not even a Muslim at that time. And he saw the help of God. And then he started in search of the religion of God. From Christianity to Buddhism and from Buddhism to Islam. And then he became Yusuf Islam. Just giving this example in order for us to understand dua, which we call the prayer. The, the prayer from the unseen power is whenever you, have in, you are in trouble, make dua to the Almighty and see how your spirituality resonates with the teaching of Islam. Call upon that one true God. 
and the most popular and the most effective of the names of that almighty God is Allah. Call upon Allah and say, oh Allah, help me, assist me, guide me, provide me, and you will see the change in your life. Okay. Uh, coming back to the topic of West, um, just wanted to know, um, uh, again, uh, you know, mere demographics here. Uh, what's the, uh, you know, sort of percentage uh, of people um, accepting Islam? And when I, uh, you know, talk about demographics, what I, um, you know, actually um, mean to understand is uh, what's the number of men accepting Islam to the number of women accepting right. Islam? Because this will actually take me to my next question. Sure. Well, um, before I, I answer that, let me just bring about further aspect to that is with, with the ter in terms of spirituality this is what is connected even to the men and women embracing islam we'll come to that with the aspect of spirituality when when people embrace islam and they're moving into islam when they are able to connect themselves and they can see the change for themselves only then is when a person embraces or changes their faith so when we come to this point of people embracing islam when people understand something when people have a firm belief in something when they do see a change in their life when they see a miracle in their life or when they can clearly intellectually understand the perspective of a faith that is when they turn and embrace islam now men and women what are the numbers let me put it this way men and women when they see the truth they embrace islam it's not one or the other it's not men or the women both genders, when they find the truth, they embrace Islam. However, when a person or a particular society is more oppressed than the other, then they turn to Islam more quickly. For example, at the time of Musa -Islam and, Har and Firaun, who were the ones who embraced the truth? The Bani Israel, before the Pharaonites, right? Before the people who followed Firaun. Why? Because these were the subjugated and the oppressed people. When they saw the equality offered, by Musa salam, so they embraced the religion of God. At the time of Prophet Muhammad salam, the first few ones who embraced Islam or the bulk or the majority ones who became Muslim in the early days included those who were the poor in the society. Why? There was a concept of slavery at that time and when they saw that the master and the slave have both equal position in the sight of God, then it was the slaves who were embracing Islam one after the other. The same in America when we talked about earlier about Malcolm X and, 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 and uh, Muhammad Ali. The black Americans were embracing Islam in herds in large numbers. Why? Because they could see the equality offered in Islam. That Islam was able to curb racism of the society. Was able to challenge this narrative of the white man's superiority or supremacy over the others. When they could see this, that's when they embraced Islam. So similarly in a society, when the women are more subjugated and oppressed, when majority of the assaults are committed against women, when domestic violence is perpetrated against women, when women are not equal, not given equal rights in the society, that is when more women would be embracing Islam compared to men. It's not that one to one gender truth appeals more to the other, no. But when a particular gender or a particular group of people are more oppressed and they could resonate with Islam, their number would be higher than, than men. And I believe this is one of the reasons that even here in Australia, when you see the number of people who embrace Islam, and I will give you an example of our own organization. When we do street dawah here in Melbourne, and we have connections with partner organizations in, in each city of Australia, and we are talking about 10 to 15 dawah groups doing street dawah. When we have every week a half a dozen people embracing Islam, every month when we have 50 people embracing Islam, throughout the year when we have 500 people embracing Islam, directly through our contacts and we compare the numbers the women embracing Islam are is higher than the men embracing Islam now there are other factors to it but as I said one of the major is when a particular group is abused in the society and they see the strength that Islam gives them then they are more likely to embrace Islam than the other yeah, uh, definitely answers that um, now just along those lines um, if you can highlight um, uh, you know, uh, in a bit more summarized way, what are some of the rights that Islam gives to a woman, which a woman can't really find anywhere except Islam? Right. Jazakallah. Very, very important aspect, especially when the West bombards 
continually by saying that Islam does not give equal rights to women. The first and foremost, in a family structure we spoke earlier, mother has a higher position in Islam compared to the father. A person came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked, whom should I serve? The Prophet said, is your mother alive? He says, yes, the Prophet says, serve your mother. He asks, who next? The Prophet repeats, your mother. Who next? The Prophet repeats the third time, your mother. The fourth time the companion asks, O oh, Rasul, O oh, Prophet of Allah, who next? The Prophet says, your father. So the three times, the continuous repetition of the Prophet about mother clearly emphasizes the higher position and status of mother compared to the father. The second, the Prophet said that the paradise lies beneath the feet of your mother. That means your slavery, your servanthood, your obedience is for your mother. And through your mother, you're going to be entering paradise. Yes, father is equally important, not denying that, but the position of mother is lofty in terms of Islamic um, equality and rights. Second, the position of daughters and sons. A person came to the Prophet and said, I've got three daughters. The Prophet said, in that time, you remember, in that time, if you go back, the, the daughters were buried alive because people thought that daughters were either cursed or they will bring financial trouble to the family or this was the ego of the society of that time that they wanted to kill their daughters because they thought daughters are inferior to the sons. In such a crooked society, the Prophet ﷺ came with the idea that it is the daughters that will lead you to paradise. So when the companion came and said, I've got three daughters, the Prophet said, if you look after them and if you raise them up well in obedience of God, and if you marry them to the best people, then you will be guaranteed the paradise. And then the companion said, I've got two daughters, the Prophet said, even you. It clearly shows, and nobody said, if you have three sons, you will go to paradise. <laughs> because probably the challenge is much higher there. <laughs> I've got three sons and I can assure you what, where the problem lies there. Because the daughters are very much, uh, uh, you know, organized and disciplined compared to the, uh, to the boys. Not being against the, the gender of men, but just, just <laughs> giving my own personal experience. Coming back to the subject, it clearly shows the mother is your pathway to paradise. The daughters will lead you to paradise. And when it comes to husband and wife, in Australia, for example, domestic violence is one of the massive national problems today. Every week, two women are murdered by their present or ex-partners. That is the level of domestic violence being perpetrated here in Australia. What's the punishment for the perpetrators? A couple of months of jail or maybe a couple of years. What is the Islamic punishment for murder? Death penalty. What is the punishment for abusing and hurting your wife? Lashes in the middle of the city. I'll give you one example. In 2017, there was a case that was brought up in, 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 the, in the court in Saudi Arabia, one of the most conservative societies in, in the world of today, in, in our time. And the judge said the man hurt his wife. So the judge gave uh, 30 lashes to the man in the middle of the city. The wife became worried about this punishment and she wanted to take her case back. The judge said such a man who has committed this atrocity will be made an example for the society. We cannot take the case back now. So my point here is if you are a domestic violence perpetrator, you are better off here in Australia or in the West compared to a society which implements Islamic law. Why? Because Islam gives higher level of support. Islam gives superior rights to women. People say Islam does not have equal rights for women. I agree. Islam does not give equal rights to women because Islam gives superior rights to women in several aspects of human relationships. So why do women become Muslim and what does Islam has to offer to the woman? This is the most powerful teaching that Islam offers that the perpetrators against women will be harmed, will be punished. If somebody commits sexual assault or rape, there is almost death penalty in certain cases. It clearly shows the severity of punishment that is there in Islam while the problem is exponentially increasing in the West of sexual assaults, Islam has the absolute solution to it. Early marriage, no intermingling between the sexes, no alcoholism in the society, and gender respect from childhood. And if somebody yet commits assault, severe penalty and punishment according to the Sharia law. The only ones who hate Sharia law after this are the very perpetrators who commit sexual assault or who commit domestic violence. Hope that answers the question. Jazakallah no, khair, brother. That was quite an informative session. Inshallah, viewers um, do find um, this very beneficial. Uh, do share, like, and subscribe us. Uh, Inshallah, we'll be back with another episode. Uh, the other thing that I want to say uh, to you before I leave is if you got any topic in your mind uh, that you want us to suggest, to discuss, 
in the coming weeks do leave us uh, your comments and inshallah we'll address them jazakumullahu khair wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi